Hi, welcome to Exploring Florida. Today, I'm at National Audubon Society's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. It's one of the last undisturbed bald cypress strands left in Florida. My guide is Paul Hinchcliffe. I'm your host, Chris Temke. Let's get started. Thanks a lot. Nice to be here. It's uh, in fact, it's great to be here. I just finished walking uh, through the boardwalk to get to you here. A lot of birds out there. Uh, I even saw some limpkins. There's, uh, that's kind of a neat bird. While I've been waiting for you up here on the tower, I've been listening to limpkins call on the marsh around us. Uh, I believe there's a pair nesting in the forest out here behind us. Uh, are they a fairly common bird in this area? Because it's not a real common bird overall, is it? Uh, they do tend to have a bit of a shy character, uh, but they're not uncommon. There's quite a few of them around. Uh, they just have a habitat that, uh, or habitat needs that don't lend themselves to people observation very often. Hmm. Well now, I've walked all the way through the, the, the cypress forest, and I'm out here now in what, this is what you call a, a prairie, right? This is the central marsh central that marsh. is in the center of this horseshoe-shaped strand of bald cypress, the last great bald cypress forest in America. The central marsh is, is pretty much dominated, however, by coastal plain willow and sawgrass and provides a good marsh habitat abutting the bald cypress forest habitat. It's generally a good place for a wide variety of birds. Now, is all of this a part of Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary? All, all of this is in here? the sanctuary, yes. The sanctuary is about 11,000 acres, uh, where the boardwalk area is really a rather small part of that. So everything that you've seen uh, while you're on the trail is within Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. Of course, and I also notice it's pretty wet out there, too. Uh, it's not supposed to be this wet this time of year, is it? We're in the winter That's time, good, and it's supposed to be dry. Good question, good point. Uh, the rains in January, our mid-January rains this year, that brought uh, here at the sanctuary about eight inches of rain in, over a period of uh, three or four days, have raised water levels higher than they were even last wet season. And so the forest looks beautiful right now. Um, a vast expanse of, of carpet of water along the fl floor of the forest and the birds have, have taken to it well. It has dispersed the fish that are in that uh, aquatic, food, source, huh? aquatic birds. food chain, and the uh, birds are now spread out. And so we're hearing a good variety of them uh, just about every morning. Well, how many species of birds are there, of course, crew? There, there's a couple hundred, maybe? The species list itself for the sanctuary has about 189 species on it. Any good day that you go out in the forest and find 30 or 40 species, you're doing pretty good. Uh, for the type of habitat that the boardwalk trail goes over, a species list for a day's observation, 35, 40 birds, is pretty typical. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, we could sit here and talk for our, all morning, but uh, why don't we go out and, and walk back through the boardwalk and, and look for some of these birds and, and just see what else the course crew has to offer, because there's a lot here. Sounds good. The forest is real rich this morning. All right, let's go. Well, Paul, how long has uh, Audubon been involved out here? I know Corkscrew, I'm just, obviously this place has been here for a long time, but how long has Audubon been involved? Audubon's had wardens in this area of Florida, in fact, guarding these very forests, uh, the rookeries within the forest, since 1912. But it wasn't until 1954 that we actually took title to this property and through here, and 1955 that the Boardwalk Trail was first opened to the public. So this boardwalk has been here for 55. This is 90. Uh, this is our math 36. tells me 36 years. 36 huh? winter season here at, at Corkscrew this year. Uh, the trail has increased in size up to its present two-mile loop size at this uh, over the last 36 years. And this year we'll have as many as 65,000 people come visit. That's a lot of people. And I guess one of the things they see are these just massive cypress trees. I mean, this is a this is a huge one here. Uh, any idea how old this one might be? We think that most of the forest seems to date from about 500 years ago. And there's a couple of reasons to think that. Some of the 
uh, the corings that we've done from other trees and other parts of the strand, the soil profile in through here. All the evidence that we can get seems to indicate that most of the forest seems to date from about 500 years ago. Wow, that's uh, th these trees have seen a lot of history then, <laughs> or been around about for a lot. About the time that Columbus uh, was coming across yeah. the ocean, this forest and uh, these trees were, were perhaps mere saplings. Mm. Now these trees, cypress trees in general, are, are really kind of neat trees because they live in essentially a wet environment to most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how do they how do they get by in, in such a wet environment? They've got some unique adaptations. That's actually their preferred habitat. Uh, some of the adaptations are, are rather strange too. They have uh, projections off the roots called cypress knees. Mm -hmm. uh, the function of the knees is rather debated and not very well understood by by people, but some people think it's for gas exchange. And other people, people think, think it's, it's for structural stability to try to help hold the the root systems together, act like a vertical peg in those root systems. There's perhaps only maybe 10 or 12 feet of soil down uh, below these trees, down to cap rock, and so uh, a tree that's perhaps six feet in diameter, 100 feet tall, is going to need some extra support, and the knees perhaps provide that. You know, the knees do something else too that that I know a lot of people have a real problem with. You can, you can travel around parts of Florida and you can see these things uh, cut into slabs and made into clocks and, and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Does that hurt the cypress tree if you cut off its knees? Not any more than trimming branches would or, or um, perhaps carving your name in, into them. Uh, it wouldn't end up being the death of a tree, but it certainly is an abuse of the tree. Yeah, something we probably, probably wouldn't look too good to go out around here and see all of your cypress knees uh, mm -hmm. cut down or something like that. Well, cypress are now a protected species. The wetlands that they, that they live in are, are vital habitats, not only for wildlife, but actually for us as well. That these wetlands provide us with, with a vital source of our drinking water. Hmm. I know uh, there's some other things here as well. This looks like a, a maple. This is a red, red maple. maple huh? Yeah, the ones that many of our visitors and a lot of the residents in Florida now might be familiar with from up north. Uh, they have a very wide range of, of habitats, all the way from the tundra to the tropics, but they always like to keep their feet wet, pretty yeah. much anywhere you find them. I see some of these knees here. Uh, they seem to also have a lot of uh, other things growing out of them as well, some other shrubs and ferns and things. Now, many of the visitors will come out here and look for knees specifically and can't see them. That's mostly because all these ferns are, are growing in a mat of cypress needles and other leaf debris that are formed on top of the cypress knees themselves. And so they get covered, but there is a veritable city of knees right out in, in this part of the forest. Okay. What's the, uh, the large green uh, leafy plant here. Yeah, people often ask if it's, if it's related to bananas, and in a rather distant way it is. It's called fire flag or alligator flag, and provides a, a nice green leafy backdrop for much of these open pond areas in the middle of the bald cypress strand. Are these pond areas just what natural depressions that uh, are in the ground here that fill up with water? We call this little uh, area through the middle of the strand here a slough, and it's a little deeper uh, water, a little lower soil base, uh, a little deeper organic buildup on the bottom. Um, the fern understory doesn't have a chance to, to take root directly in that, and some of the other shrubs and bushes don't, don't invade it quite as, as readily. And so you end up with these open pond areas through the forest. A little ways up the walk here, uh, back in 1960, a hurricane came through, uh, blew down a lot of, of wooden uh, tree into that area, and the shrubs have taken over, and so some of that is filled in in, in this next few yards of the walk. But right back in through here, the the forest opens out into these beautiful ponds. Everything is kind of recycled in the forest, isn't it? it it's used over and when a tree falls mm -hmm. down, things will grow out of it or take, take root on it. It's in fact, uh, trees falling down are one of the few ways that, that the ferns and much of the other shrubby vegetation has a way of rooting. It provides that real estate uh, that would perhaps have a little higher elevation than the forest floor itself. Now, during certain times of the year, though, this area would actually be dry, wouldn't it? Uh, and very importantly so. Uh, the forest yeah, must end up drying down periodically or the cypress trees themselves won't have a chance to, the seeds won't have a chance to germinate and take root. Uh, for regeneration of trees into the forest, it needs to dry down periodically. And the dry season is a very vital part of, uh, of the hydrologic cycle in this part of, of Florida. I know this one of my favorite plants is this resurrection fern here. And it's kind of interesting, you know, there's water right beneath it, but it's all shriveled up and dry now. I guess it hasn't rained in a while. Uh, not for the last several days, but uh, a matter of hours after the rain falls, this will end up being a lush carpet of ferns that will completely coat the trunk of, in this case, a pop ash tree, one of the typical trees of, of the cypress tram. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's head over towards uh, Lettuce Lake and see what uh, kind of birds we might find there, okay? I expect it'll be good this morning. Okay. Well, you know, Paul, uh, Corkscrew's got a lot of big birds because I've seen a lot of them, but there's got to be a lot of small birds in this area too, aren't there? That's uh, a good point. This is some of the best small bird habitat in the boardwalk area that we're walking through right now. This part of the trail area I call Warbler Alley, uh, but these bald cypress, the pop ash, uh, mid-story trees and the custard apple areas all seem to, to attract the flocks of especially wintering small birds, uh, warblers, vireos. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this morning I heard uh, some Carolina wrens or some wrens calling in here. I saw here. some cardinals out towards the edge. Uh, uh, great crested flycatchers, yeah. perhaps as many as nine and ten species of warblers, uh, especially in the migration times. As I say, yeah, these, a lot of these birds migrate through here. This is a great stop for migrating birds, isn't it? Yes, it's uh, all, uh, this area can be downright spectacular during spring and fall migration. I think perhaps the maples that are in here, the red maple trees with their sweet sap attract them as, as much as anything. And, but this is a concentration point right here near the South Lettuce Lake on the boardwalk. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, uh, looking at this uh, wet spot here, it looks like a really good place for an alligator to hang around. These pond openings are a good habitat. They like to lounge about in them, but uh, more commonly we see them sunning down by the lettuce lake areas. It's just more open and we can see them more easily. You know, we were lucky though this morning when yes. we were out uh, back yeah. by the, the observation tower there, we heard an alligator bellowing and that, that's something you do all the time. Uh, there were two of them out there bellowing back and forth yeah, to one another, yeah, right. letting each other know where, where they are and keeping their distance from one another, spreading the food resource out, avoiding competition. And one of them sounded like he was A, pretty close, and B, pretty big. And he was both of those <laughs> things. He was next to the walk right there, and up, that gator seems to have gone eight, nine foot. Yeah, I'm glad he was in the water, not up on the boardwalk. They don't ever climb up here, do they? Never known them to be on the boardwalk. Uh, but I've watched them crawl under the boardwalk just a few feet away from, from us on a regular basis. It's a, a real good place to end up finding alligators in their natural element. Yeah. Yeah, if people want to see them, it's a good place to do it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, uh, let's head over to Lettuce Lake and see what's there. All right. It's just a few yards up around the bend here. Okay. Paul, where are we? This is the North Lettuce Lake, one of uh, my favorite spots along the boardwalk, some of the best wading bird habitat in, uh, along the trail. Now these lakes, uh, these are pretty typical of the cypress swamp, aren't they? People are, don't always see them, though. There's a number of these holes out in the cypress strands around. This is one of the largest of them, and it happens to be right on the midst of the boardwalk trail here. Now, I think on the way out this morning, this is where I saw the, uh, the limpkin. It was right over there, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, just on the other side down here. One of the first times I'd seen them out in the lettuce lake in several months. They were out looking for their, their meal, right? The morning meal, most likely? The water lettuce that's floating on the surface of the pond gives them good footing. And they're probably out there looking for their favorite food, the apple snail. Uh, this is good apple snail habitat, and therefore good limpkin habitat, because their favorite meal is out here. Yeah, I noticed a number of the birds, like the, uh, the little blue heron, and uh, uh, there was some white ibis over there. They all mm -hmm. seem to be able to walk on the water. They're actually walking on the water lettuce, right? Mm -hmm. The plant, which now is this, how the lake got its name. Well, this large floating plant, uh, Pistia, is its scientific name. That It flood, uh, floods the... Bleh. <laughs> covers the surface of the lake. Uh, and at times it will end up just completely covering it. It looks like a, a big carpet of, of, of Boston lettuce out there. Okay. It's not edible, is it? Uh, it's uh, eatable and edible are two different kinds of terms. Uh, <laughs> this is highly uneatable. It tastes a lot like wet styrofoam. I <laughs> you tried it, no I, doubt. I get asked that a lot, and I have tried it. <laughs> <laughs> well, is this, uh, this must be where a lot of the birds hang out, right? In this here? is probably some of the best wading bird habitat around. Uh, provides a lot of different depths and a variety of different food sources, from mm -hmm. small fish to crawdads to the apple snails to aquatic insects. Uh, and it's also one of the best places to be seen. Uh, it's one of the more conspicuous places that, that, that visitors can get to to find the wading bird population here. I know she got these nice benches. You can just sit here and, and sort of relax and, and look and everything. You know, there's one bird we haven't talked about, and I know we haven't seen any yet today because the water levels are up real high, but it's a bird that everybody associates with corkscrew, and that's the wood stork. Wood storks. I'm looking at your patch here, and I see it there, the wood yeah. stork. 
Uh, these trees that surround the, the lettuce lake around us here are a rookery area for them. Uh, wood storks have in the past built their nests right here directly over the visitors' heads with as many as 12, 14 nests in a single tree. And the raucous noise that the young make uh, demanding to be fed you know, fills the air in here like a, like a cacophony of sound. This it's is a time of year we should be seeing them, but we're not, mm -hmm. are we? Is that because the water level's still being up? I expect it's because they can't find enough food, and this year it's probably because there just isn't enough fish in all of the water that we happen to have at the moment to, to make the investment in breeding worthwhile for them. So we don't know, you don't know really if they're going to breed or not this year, We right? never really know until they, des they decide to start. <laughs> uh, last March they rather caught us off, off guard and, and decided to start as late as March, and last year 310 pair did breed, and they, they fledged 470 young. Now that's down quite a bit from the numbers of back in the 60s, isn't it, when there were a lot more wood storks around? In just 30 years we've seen... Uh, a decline, a, a, dr a rather drastic decline. In 1961, for instance, 6,000 pairs of wood storks fledged 17,000 young. But the best year out of the 1980s that they could manage was 755 pairs fledging 1,900 young in 1988 quite a drop over a short period of time. Drastic isn't it? drop, principally due to a, a lack of being able to find food, the, the, the small fish that are their principal food. Hey, you know, Paul, this, this area is just, just beautiful. Lettuce Lake is one of the really pretty spots in uh, Corkscrew here. One of my favorites. You know, I've also heard a lot of birds out here this morning. Some of them you can't see, the smaller birds. But, you know, mm -hmm. there's another thing I've heard too, Paul. In the background, every once in a while, I catch the, the little bit of sounds of humanity, you might say. Airplanes overhead. Airplanes, trucks. Trucks. Mm -hmm. Are people encroaching on Corkscrew? Is it going to be a problem? The cliche that I use to to discuss that is usually that, that we're a lot closer to town than we used to be and we haven't moved. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess people are, are moving out this the way. The area is growing, uh, one of the fastest growing areas of Florida, indeed one of the fastest growing areas of the whole country. Uh, but one of the, the wonders of Corkscrew and the wonders of this watershed is how intact it is, how, how in a relative sense, how pristine this, the, the flowway uh, of water, and in this case moving from our left to our right, is, is, is gathered up in the upper end of the watershed and flowing out to the coast in pretty much a historical pattern, the way it always has. So this area is sort of has been protected mm -hmm. from all this in the future. What about the future? I know you know, from driving around this area, there's some agricultural act activity in this area as well as people moving into it. New subdivisions. New subdivisions and, and tomato fields, and I know the mm -hmm. citrus is moving into this area. Is that going to get up to where it's on your boundaries eventually? Well, it is on the boundaries now. And in fact, there's a neighborhood that's, that surrounds much of the eastern part, uh, the eastern side of the sanctuary. But, uh, and with improper planning or without planning, that could end up being a disaster for, for the sanctuary and for the wildlife that lives in it and for us as people that need the water uh, for our drinking water in the future. Uh, it's projects like the CRU, the Corkscrew Regional Ecosystem Watershed, that have the ability to do that planning for the future that, that would al allow development in the area and yet keep the watershed intact and pristine. Now that crew program, they're, they're planning to what, manage land and also buy some additional lands around here, right, to protect a, a, another part of the watershed at least. The, the National Audubon property here is 11,000 acres in, in the heart of this crew watershed. The remainder of the watershed left intact at this point amounts to about 45,000 acres and there is a plan afoot underneath, uh, under the Save Our Rivers plan, to acquire that watershed, those watershed acres in the public interest and manage them in conjunction with the sanctuary uh, by a consortium of agencies for, again, not just, not just the wildlife values, but for our own values, for our own source of fresh water in the future. Yeah, because water, certainly fresh water, is a, is a key to it, and we get so much of it from such, you know, so close to the surface and the ground and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned something. You said that, and you said this earlier, too, Corkscrew is 11,000 acres. We've only seen a few acres of it, really, by walking mm -hmm. around here. We've walked in a circle of perhaps uh, 80 acres in its center. Okay. What are the chances of maybe getting out of this area and getting to some of the areas and, and taking a look where, where other people can't always get all the time? The north end of the Corkscrew Sanctuary is one of the great landscapes in Collier County, and I'd be happy to show it to you. Well, let's go. Mm -hmm. well, welcome to the North Marsh here at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. That's a nice looking place. Now, this is a big maiden cane spartina grass marsh. 
and forms one of the principal flowways for the, the water that is the heartbeat, the, the, the very lifeblood of the sanctuary. See some birds out there already. Yeah. Let's see if we can climb up on the truck bed and have a closer look. Okay. Looking across the marsh over to the west side strand, notice the little black shapes in the tops of the snags? Yeah, I can see them. Now, those are turkey vultures and black vultures, There's sometimes as many as a couple thousand of them. Yeah, there's quite a few also flying around. You know, I noticed something too, you know, a lot of people have a hard time telling uh, those big birds when they're on the wing, but it's really pretty easy, isn't it? The vultures fly with a V shape. Mm -hmm. Call it dihedral. They dihedral. fly in a dihedral mm -hmm. V there, and body the lower than the wingtips. Yeah, and the eagles and the hawks are going to be more out straight, right? Much more flat winged, yeah. uh, almost a, oh, as if they were, they were much more stiff. Uh, the turkey vultures also go through a kind of a tippy rocking motion in the air that the uh, eagles, hawks, falcons just won't have. They'll fly pretty much straight and, straight and level, level and, mm -hmm. and glide a lot. Of course, they're all they're soaring and gliding, riding the thermals and things like that. Mm -hmm. it must be uh, kind of fun. Now, there are two species of uh, vultures in the right. area. Black mm -hmm. vultures do fly a bit more flat wing than the turkey vultures do. Uh, but the pattern on the underside of the wing, the gray trailing edge to the wing on turkey vultures and the white patches out towards the edges of the wings for the black vultures are good field marks and, and make them re relatively easy to, to distinguish. Mm -hmm. Now, what else are we liable to see out here? Uh, certainly some ibis or herons and egrets, right? Uh, ibis will roost in, in these willow heads across the marsh out here in, in big numbers. We might see, oh, if we're lucky tonight, perhaps as many as a thousand of them or more that will take to those willows as their evening roost. Uh, egrets, herons of maybe six or seven different kinds. Uh, as we were just sitting here a moment ago, I was listening to some king rails calling out uh, amongst us. So, there's a number of different birds that use these big expanses of, of grass marsh. Yeah, and then we saw that deer too. That were well, actually there's two of them: the young, the mm -hmm. little buck with the spikes, and it looked like maybe a doe with them. Uh, deer have been doing pretty well here in the last few years in the sanctuary. Yeah, it sure is pretty out here. You can just sort of uh, scan the landscape, and uh, uh, it's very peaceful and quiet. Also, here comes a big uh, cloud of, of ibis getting up just on over there. Oh yeah. Now they're going to move around some before they settle down? They take a couple of pre-roosts uh, prior to the final roost for the evening. And at this time of the afternoon, they would probably be uh, soaring about into a couple of different pre-roosting sites. Uh, just about sunset, then they'll settle into probably one of these willow heads and take that as the final evening roost. What time in the morning do they come out? Do they come out right at, at first light at sunrise and they just disperse out from there? Not nearly as in such a concentrated manner as they do in the evening. That seems to be a much more uh, defined, easy to follow kind of a movement of, of the big flocks of birds into the roost. Morning flight out is much more piecemeal. A uh, few birds leave, few birds there. They don't seem to ever fly out in a big mass like they come into the roost. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because during the day, they disperse out and, and just sort of go their own individual ways, but at night they'll come back together. Is that for protection at night, or is it just their behavior pattern? A uh, combination of uh, forces that would uh, cause that. I've uh, read some, some studies lately that would say that, that roosting behavior that would find many of them sharing the same roost at, at, in the evening does uh, have value in, in its safety. Uh, safety in numbers, many more ears and eyes to pick up uh, predators around us. Other reasons ibis would prefer to roost communally would be not just the isolation from predators that they might find, but also the isolation from man and the disturbances that we cause to uh, the areas that they like to roost in, like coastal mangrove uh, estuary forests and, and even the edges of these cypress strands and, and much of the area here in the big cypress. The herons and things, there, there are some of those that nest in this area, right? Uh, yes, there are. Um, uh, great egrets, little blue herons, tricolored herons, uh, great blues all use the, the big cypress trees as, as a rookery area during the later part of the spring. This roost of ibis seems to be getting up. Yeah, I see that. Paul, um, you know, a lot of people have trouble being confused with the ibis and the herons and the egrets when they're flying on the wing. What method do you use to distinguish which is which? Because it's awfully hard sometimes. It's basically a profile type of a, an approach I take. The, 
uh, herons and egrets will all fly with uh, their neck characteristically tucked back against their, their breast, where the ibis, spoonbills, storks will fly with their neck extended. And even if you can't see the color, because they might be so high in the sky or against an odd colored background, you can see that profile. And so that profile is a very, very important thing. Yeah, a lot of birds you have to identify by their silhouette. Because mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, early in the morning, you just can't see those colors. Like a mm -hmm. snow egret, you just can never see those yellow feet unless the light's just right. Just right. Mm -hmm. now they, uh, the rhythm that they pump their wings uh, going through the air, for instance, herons and egrets have a rather steady pump as they're traveling through the air, where ibis will will characteristically uh, make several flaps and then glide a short distance, a flap, flap, glide, as opposed to that steady rowing motion that, that herons and egrets go through the air with, are all good field marks to use at a distance. Yeah, yeah the sun's starting to get down. Let's, let's just look for a minute with our glasses and see what we can see, because I'm starting to see a lot of activity down, down to our south here, some birds coming up and, and coming back sunset. down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sunset's going to be nice, too. There's a couple of great egrets against the, the far trees. Mm-hmm. A lot of vultures starting to come down in some of those tops of the cypress out there as well. What about the future of course you? What, uh, what do you think is going to happen here in the next few years? I take a, an optimistic approach to it. I think it looks pretty good. I think uh, programs like Save Our Rivers and, and the crew acquisition are just exactly the answer we need to try and, and preserve this part of our natural heritage. Uh, but it's not only the natural history that, that we'd like to be able to ensure, it's also our own survival for the sake of uh, the fresh water that these, that these watersheds will provide us in the future that I think are, are, going, to be the, uh, are going to ensure the fact that, that, that these lands will get saved. I'm quite optimistic about it. There's a lot of good things happening uh, about environmental protection in South Florida. Sometimes we tend to listen to a lot of the, the, the bad horror stories and, and forget some of the good actions that are being taken. Yeah. Well, you know, aesthetically, it, it, it's hard to beat this. You just can't. But as you said, you know, the water, I mean, there's a real economic component to all of this as well mm -hmm. that, that sort of is underlying and people don't always see. But, uh, you know, for now, I'll, I'll just kind of take the beauty of it for, for the rest of the day, at least. It's really nice. And, it is that. Oh, I want to thank you for uh, showing me around here today. This has uh, been real fun. It's always fun to come out to Corkscrew, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of many enjoyable days to come out here. I've had a real nice time with you, starting from our, our early dawn admission to the boardwalk and lasting out to sunset here on the North Mark. It's been a great day. Yeah, it's a fun day. Thanks again. You bet. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.